I'm Brad Chamberlain. I'm the technical lead for the Chapel Project at Hewlett Packard. And I want to express my appreciation to Sanjay and to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, it was suggested that I talk about some of the things that are new with Chapel. So I picked out three of the things that I've been recently excited about, and they resulted in a nice amount of uh, uh, symmetry here in the title. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few user applications that I'm particularly excited about these days, um, some work we've been doing with aggregators in Chapel, and then some work we've been doing targeting accelerators. Um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me get focus in the right window. All right, so uh, what is Chapel? Um, if you're not familiar with it, I'm not going to be able to give you a very in-depth introduction today, but you'll hopefully pick up a little bit of this as we go. Um, it is a modern parallel programming language. It's designed to be portable and scalable. Uh, so we do a lot of our development on just sort of commodity laptops. Uh, I do a lot of mine on a Mac. And then you can take those programs and run them on clusters or the cloud or supercomputers by HPE or other vendors. And it's an open source and collaborative project. So we do our uh, development at GitHub. It's licensed with the Apache 2.0 license. And like any good open source project, we get uh, code contributions from users and collaborators in the open source community. Um, the two high level goals of Chapel are to support general parallel programming, which you can think of as if you have some parallel algorithm in mind and some parallel hardware that you'd like to run that on, you ought to be able to do that in Chapel or else we're not succeeding at this goal. And the second is to make parallel programming at scale far more productive than it is today. So in particular, trying to get beyond the sort of MPI plus X world that a lot of the HPC community is relying on to do their applications today. Um, sometimes people like to know how Chapel compares to other languages. Uh, probably the easiest way to say it is we're trying to create a language that is as um, nice to read and write code in as Python, which I think for a lot of people is sort of the standard to beat nowadays in terms of easy to, easy to use. Um, but where Python has historically had problems with performance and parallelism and scalability, um, we want to sort of maintain what is sort of expected from HPC. So scalar code that's as fast as Fortran, um, scalable as MPI or Shmem or UPC, as portable as C in the sense that you can run it anywhere, and as flexible as C++ in the sense of being able to create your own types or overload operators or methods or you know, sort of expand the language from within the language, if you will. And then the last bullet here sometimes gets a little snicker within the HPC community, but it's about being as fun as your favorite programming language because our belief is that many people get into programming because they really think it's fun, they enjoy it. Um, but frankly, in HPC, I mean, it's fun to run on big systems and get good performance, but the programming part of it, I would say most people don't find that fun. And I think as a community, we have a hard time attracting and retaining people for that reason. So what can we do to make programming HPC systems fun in addition to thrilling? This is my sort of one slide overview of Chapel, and we'll get a little bit into some more of the code later on, but only just a, a bit today. Um, so over here on the left, I've got a couple of standard benchmarks, stream triad at the top and HPC challenge random access at the bottom. And these are written in C plus MPI. And so as you might expect from those models, there's quite a bit of code to express what are really some fairly straightforward computations. These blue boxes in the middle show the equivalent chapel code. And so you can see it's much more succinct. Um, and if you spend a little time with it, you'd probably be able to guess what it's doing pretty well. Um, and the reason there is, again, that we have leveraged a lot of advances in modern programming language design. And we've also implemented parallelism and locality as first class concerns in the language. We think these are the two main things that HPC programmers um, need to be uh, concerned about. So rather than sort of tacking them in after the fact, they're sort of built into the language from the start. And then over here on the right, I've got a couple of performance graphs. These are going up to 256 nodes or about 9,000 cores on a Cray XC. You can see in the case of stream triad that we're basically uh, competing neck and neck with the reference version. In the case of random access, we're actually um, outscaling the reference version by a large amount. This is to a large extent because we've written the computation in a high level way that lets the compiler optimize it better. And it's a particularly good match for the Cray XC, which has atomic operations in the network. Um, so that's a case where we can really do great. Um, now, if it were only benchmarks, that's not all that interesting. So um, in the past few years, we sort of moved from being like, yeah, try out the language and see what you think about it, but you might not want to use it for your real work to actually encouraging people to use it more and more for real applications. So this slide shows a handful of the most notable current applications being developed in Chapel. And I'll be talking about a few of these today. Um, so this is actually a good time for me to uh, jump to my outline. So I've given you just a bit of context for Chapel. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about a couple applications that I particularly like these days. Um, then I'll give you a quick tour of some basic Chapel features that will be helpful for the rest of the talk. 
uh, the section on aggregation, section on aggregators, and then of course I'll wrap up. All right, so jumping back to this application slide, one of the things I really like about this application slide is that early on in the project, um, people would say, you know, if you just had a killer app, uh, you know, people would stop asking like, why are you doing a new language and stuff? But we were sort of resistant to having a killer app because we didn't want to get pegged as like a one app language or anything like that. And so one of the things I really like about the slide is that you've got, you know, sort of traditional scientific simulations up here at the top, like computational fluid dynamics and astrophysics. And then you've got more sort of data science or um, sort of numerical computing types of things like um, this Arcuda and NumPy, uh, this branch and bound optimization framework, and some AI work that we're doing in-house here. So the first app I want to dive into just a little bit today is Arcuda. And uh, again, Arcuda is basically a Python library that supports um, NumPy and Pandas at large scales for doing data science on huge data sets. And so we usually say that this computes massive scale results within the human thought loop, where massive scale is like multi-terabyte scale arrays, so often dozens of terabytes in each array. And then within the human thought loop is to turn those operations around in seconds to minutes so you don't lose your train of thought uh, as you're sort of going through a hypothesis and massaging your data and manipulating it and examining it. And this approach uses a Python client chapel server model. So the user uh, is essentially sitting in their Jupyter notebook typing Python commands that look a lot like normal NumPy and Pandas commands, but they're implemented using the Arcuda uh, library rather than NumPy or Pandas. And then under the covers, that's communicating out to a server written in chapel out on the on the supercomputer or whatever that's actually doing the computation. And that gets you the scalability and performance. So this is an application that's currently about 16,000 lines of Chapel, most of which was written in 2019, but there've been continual improvements since then, both in terms of building out new features and improving the performance. This was developed um, primarily by Mike Merrill, Mike Merrill and Bill Roos at DOD. Um, there are a number of other people working on it as well now. And it's an open source project. So if this appeals to you or you just wanna dig into it some more, um, here's the link you can go and, and uh, download it and run it. And then if you were to ask them, why did they use Chapel? Um, some of the top reasons, the first one is it's a high level language with performance and scalability. And this high level part is key because since they're catering to Python users, they wanted to choose a language where if those Python users looked under the hood in order to add new capabilities or tinker with things, they wouldn't be repelled by what they saw. They would find it reasonable and natural. And in practice, they've actually had some Python users get their first HPC codes running as a result of having written this in Chapel. Um, it has great distributed array support, which are really uh, heavily used in Arcuda, and it ports from laptop to supercomputer. So like us, they do a lot of their development on MacBooks and the like, and then once they've got it working, they can just take it to the supercomputer, and it typically works right out of the box there as well. Oops, sorry. Um, so the one other thing I want to say about Arcuda, uh, so recently we've been looking a lot at sorting performance within Arcuda. And um, this is a hero run we did this summer on a large Apollo-based system from HPE. Um, we sorted 72 terabytes of 8-byte values, and we achieved a rate of 480 gigabytes per second. So it ran in about two and a half minutes. And this used 73,000 cores of AMD ROM, which is more cores than I ever would have expected I would get to run on when I was a grad student. And the part I like about this is about 100 lines of chapel code. And now I don't track uh, sort of the world of sorting very closely, but what I've been told is that this is pretty close to uh, the current world record holder for sorting performance. Um, and I would argue that if you thought about performance in terms of number of lines of source code, this quite likely is a record because I have a feeling that most others are probably a lot more heroic, although I don't know for sure. Jumping to the other application I wanna talk about today, um, let's look at this CHAMPS, which is a, a com computational fluid dynamics framework. So this, uh, as I said, 3D unstructured computational fluid dynamics framework uh, used for airplane simulation. And this is about 48,000 lines of chapel code that was written from scratch in about two years time. This, sorry, is somebody get, trying to get a word in? No, okay. Uh, so this was written by a team led by Professor Eric Laurendeau at Polytechnique Montreal, um, him and his students and postdocs. And why did they choose chapel? Well, primarily the performance and scalability was competitive with MPI plus C++. And frankly, the students found it far more productive to use. So they actually um, convinced their advisor to let them use Chapel. He was reluctant. He thought it was too risky. And uh, happily, he's now very happy that they made that choice. So in the past six months or so, the Champs team has been presenting at a number of industry and for them nationwide uh, places uh, within Canada. Um, and what's really cool about this work, I think, is that their workshops, unlike ours, 
instead of people going and talking about their work and sort of listening and then going back home again, they're typically all working on joint problems. Uh, they come in with sort of their results and they sort of share the results. Here's what we got, here's how we got them. And so it really is much more of a working workshop, I guess, than a lot of ones we go to in HPC. Um, and as a result of that, what they've found is that they're achieving uh, results that are at similar large scales and uh, quality of results to other major players in industry, government, and academia. And I think this is pretty notable. They've been able to pull this off in just a couple of years. So we invited um, Eric, their PI, to uh, give a talk at our annual workshop this past year. Um, the title of this talk is here. And I'm just going to call out some excerpts here because it sort of reinforces this productivity benefit that I mentioned. So he said, to show you what Chapel did in our lab, NS code, which was their previous framework, ended up being 120,000 lines. And my students said, we can't handle it anymore. It's too complex. We lost track of everything. And today they went from 120,000 lines down to 48,000 lines, so about three times less. But he goes on to say, but the code is not 2D, it's 3D. It's not structured, it's unstructured, which is way more complex. And it's multi-physics. It's got aero elastic and aero icing. So he's got industrial type code in 48,000 lines. So for him, this is the proof of Chapel's benefit, plus the smiles he has on his students every day in the lab because they love Chapel as well. And that's the key. That's his takeaway. And it goes on to say that Chapel promotes programming efficiency. They ask students at the master's degree to do stuff that would take two years, and they do it in three months. So they have things that they do in a summer internship that they just couldn't do before. Um, so I pulled out these quotes, obviously, because uh, they make me happy in terms of Chapel's productivity. But I want to point out the whole talk is available online, and it's a really great talk if you want to learn about um, the use of HPC within aerodynamics and uh, aeronautic simulation. All right, so with that, I'm going to jump out and give you a brief tour of a couple Chapel features that will be key for the rest of the talk. And I'm going to be focusing on the lower level features within Chapel here, specifically support for creating tasks in the language and for controlling locality. Um, so one term you need to know before I dive into some code is this term locales. In Chapel locale, which you've seen on some of my graphs, is the unit of the target architecture that can run tasks and store variables. So on most HPC systems, you can think of a locale as being a compute node, and that's a good approximation. And when you run a Chapel program, you specify the number of locales to use on the command line. So like here, I'm saying run on four locales. And so when I run my program, I'll get four compute nodes to run it on. And within the code, I'll have this built-in array called locales, which has four elements in it, one corresponding to each of those compute nodes. And the one other thing you need to know is when I start running my Chapel program, all the user code, uh, the main, if you will, is going to start running as a single task in locale zero, and then it'll spread out from there. All right, so with that, let's look at some code. This is a task parallel hello world program in Chapel. Um, and just to call out some features, uh, this identifier here that I'm referring to is essentially a built-in way of referring to the locale in which I'm currently running. So in the first query here, I'm asking how many processing units uh, or cores does this locale have? I'm storing that in a variable called num tasks. And then later on, I'm, I'm asking what the name of the locale is so I can personalize my message. Um, then we use a coferall to actually create the tasks. And a coferall is like a, a for loop in most languages, but it's a concurrent parallel loop. And so each iteration is going to be executed by a separate task. So in this case, I'm going to have a trip of the loop per core. Each of those is going to be a separate task. And so each task is going to be printing out its own little hello message. And because I haven't done anything to coordinate between those tasks or synchronize between them, those messages are going to come out in an arbitrary order, as you can see over here in my, my terminal. right? So each one sort of prints out, I'm task three of four running on this node. Now, nothing in this code refers to other locales. So this is a shared memory program, and I would never actually leave locales here if I ran it. So we don't have the kind of uh, dynamic uh, migration of data and tasks as in Charm++, for example, we're a much more explicit language in that respect. But with a fairly simple change, I can turn this into a distributed program. Um, what I'm going to do is add another outer coferall loop here, and I'm going to iterate over that locales array I was talking about before to essentially generate a task per locale. And then I'm going to use this on clause to tell each task to run on its corresponding locale. And at this point, I've essentially created SPMD execution across my machine. And then I'll execute the same coferall as before so that each one will query how many cores do I have? And let me print out a message per core. And so with that sort of additional nested parallelism, I've changed this from a shared memory code into a distributed memory code that'll run across as many compute nodes on my machine as I let it. All right, so that's your quick introduction to Chapel. With that, let's turn to some recent work we've been doing with aggregators. And this work I'm going to exhibit in the context of 
um, a bail computation. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with bail, um, particularly index gather I'm going to be looking at today. And this is basically just a gather operation. So I basically have a couple of distributed arrays, um, the destination array and the indices array, which are of the same size. And I'm going to basically be gathering from that, uh, or sorry, into that destination array from my source array, which could potentially have a different number of elements, but is also distributed. And if we look at this, uh, so this uses a for all loop. We haven't seen a for all today, but I'll tell you that under the covers, what this essentially gets lowered down to is code that we have seen today. So we have a co for all loop across all of our locales that destination array is, is uh, distributed across. And so here again, I've got that SPMD style execution. And then we do task parallelism across the cores again. And then we have a serial loop within here that's basically taking the subset of the index space that this locale owns and sort of doing those uh, updates uh, from the source uh, to the destination array, uh, which I'm realizing I, I misspelled here, um, one at a time. And so something you might think about here, uh, eventually we thought about, it took us a little while, was that you know I, as the user, have told you this is a for all loop. Uh, all the iterations can be done in parallel. There's no dependencies between them. But then at the inner loop here, I'm basically using a serial loop to implement them. And because my destination and source arrays are distributed, this is uh, typically going to be uh, generating communication and very expensive communication. So why am I doing those high latency operations serially? And so once we made this observation, we basically came in and did an optimization. Um, so since you've asserted to us that this is a for all loop, that these are order independent iterations, what we do is in our compiler, we now rewrite this serial loop into this uh, loop that uses an unordered copy. You can think of this as like a fire and forget kind of assignment or not really forget, but forget into the next fence. So we sort of fire these off as quickly as we can. And then at the end of the for loop, we do this fence to sort of make sure that all those operations have completed before we go on. Um, and so on the next slide, what we'll see is the performance this gives us. In the light blue down here, we've got the naive version where I'm literally having each task serial do its remote gathers one at a time. And then this dark blue shows the, uh, the unordered version that I've just shown you. And you can see you get something like, I don't know, maybe an eight times performance in increase by doing that. But what we found comparing to other implementations of bail index gather was that we're still losing by quite a bit. So while this is really great, it's still really fine grain and fine grain communication is never great on HPC systems. So what we did was we implemented a new library, uh, copy aggreg aggregation library. And so I've made just a couple of minor modifications to the code here. The first is I'm actually using the module that provides the library. Um, and then I'm using this syntax, which basically gives me a task private variable within my for all loop. So rather than creating a variable one per iteration, it's one per task that's helping implement this for all. And specifically, I'm giving each task its own copy of this source aggregator object that's defined within this library. Um, and this is going to basically do aggregations and get us coarser grain communication. And the one other change I have to make here is to change my assignment into a call to this copy method on the aggregator, which basically says, um, we're doing a copy. And then what the aggregator does automatically is as it aggregates these copies and as its buffers fill up, it's going to communicate those operations to the remote locale um, automatically without any user code uh, telling it to and asynchronously. Um, so this is our aggregated version of index gather. And the performance we get there is, as you can see, much better. Um, what is it, like one and a half times better than the previous version, something like that. Um, with relatively minor and straightforward code changes, I would say. And even better than that, um, so nothing about these aggregators sort of require to change the language or change the compiler. So this is something that if we had not written it, you as a user could write it. It was about 100 lines of fairly straightforward chapel code, the entire module, something like 420 lines. And this was developed by my colleague over the past couple of years. Um, I also mentioned going back to that Arcuda hero sort we saw before, these aggregators have been key to our getting performance results like this. So if we didn't have aggregators, um, this performance, this graph wouldn't look nearly as good as it does today. And the one other thing I want to say in this section is that, um, you know, as a compiler person, I think a question that one would ask is, you know, you know, sure, this rewrite isn't that bad. I haven't had to change the code too much, but could the compiler be doing that for me? Um, so this is a question we asked in the last year or so. And uh, one of my other colleagues found that, yeah, in many cases, we can have the compiler automatically transform this simple version of the index gather into the more uh, optimized version. And this is a, a paper that Engen published in LCPC last week. So if this is something of interest to you, um, go back and take a look at that. He talks about how we achieve that. 
And what you can see on this graph in green is that that automatically aggregated version uh, using the naive implementation of the algorithm actually performs neck and neck with the manual aggregated case. So um, that's a great result for us. And that wraps up my section on aggregators. And so next, I'm going to switch to my last section about chapel on GPUs or accelerators. Um, so the case for chapel on GPUs, I think, is very simple and straightforward. You know, I said at the very beginning of the talk, chapel is designed for any parallel algorithm on any parallel architecture. But one of the more embarrassing things we've had to admit in recent years is people say, like, well, what about GPUs? And we say, well, we don't really do that yet. Um, obviously, GPUs are more and more important in HPC, so that's been a big gap in our portfolio. Now, it's not as though this has never occurred to us. Um, we've been doing work for almost 10 years on Chapel and GPUs. In fact, it was pioneered by uh, Albert Sedelnik from UIUC um, back in 2012. Um, he was the first person to get some Chapel code running on GPUs. And there have been other efforts since then that have been done, um, but none of these have made it onto master. So if you were to download the Chapel release and try to compile for GPUs, there just hasn't been any support for it until our most recent releases. Um, so I'll say that users have used Chapel with GPUs, but they've done this through interoperability. So they write their kernels in CUDA or OpenCL or things like that, um, and they call out to it. But again, that's not ideal from a productivity standpoint. And we would argue that Chapel's features for parallels and locality that you've seen are a really good match for GPUs. And for us, code generation has been the major sticking point, um, where we're currently tackling that by leveraging our LLVM backend. <coughs> So the idea here is we have something in line which called hierarchical locales. So in addition to locales I showed you earlier, locales can contain sublocales. And so this is a notional model where imagine that each of our compute nodes had a sublocale representing the GPU. And so if I said something like on here.gpu, that would say allocate this array in the GPU's memory, and then any computation within this scope would also be done by the GPU. That's sort of what we're trying to build towards. And here's a very simple computation. Let's say I say on the GPU, allocate this array. It's obviously a really small one just to fit on the slide. Um, and then do a parallel loop over the array, just incrementing by five or something like that, right? This is the kind of code we'd like to have people write and have run on a GPU. Six months ago, um, this is where we were. We had our first GPU codes running on Chapel. But to be honest, they looked pretty heroic. So you see some pragmas in here. There's some features that aren't really meant to be user facing. There's a lot of interoperability we're still relying on. But happily, in the release we just did about a month ago, um, we got our code uh, like this, basically compiling and running on the GPU. And the only real difference here between this and what I told you we were building is that rather than here.gpu, I've written here.getchild1. And the reason for that is that the locale model we're using today has child0 representing the CPU and child1 representing the GPU. So this is just kind of a not very pretty way of referring to the GPU. But apart from that, it's essentially what I told you we wanted to build. Um, this is not the ultimate locale model. So we're looking at various ways of modeling um, compute nodes with GPUs and CPUs and multiple NUMA domains. And so this slide just shows some of the different block diagrams that we're considering there. Um, one of the things we were really striving for and accomplished in this release cycle that, again, just finished up about a month ago was to take our version of Steam, Stream Triad and run that on a GPU. And if you look back at the beginning of my talk, I had a Stream Triad block. And this is pretty similar to it, a little bit different, but um, still very high level recognizable chapel code again, prefixed by that on clause to tell it to run on the GPU. And with this, um, we're getting decent performance when the problem size gets large enough. Obviously, at smaller problem sizes, we've got some amortiz amortization efforts, uh, sorry, overheads that we need to overcome uh, just in terms of what it takes to launch our kernels today. So again, this is very early days for this. I have no reason to believe we won't close this gap, um, but just to give you a snapshot of where this lives today. Um, we've got a bunch of next steps, but in the interest of time, uh, why don't I just move on? These slides will all be available afterwards, and, and you can look through these on your own time. Again, early days, there's still plenty of to do here. So with that, let me wrap up to leave some time for questions. Um, this slide's got some pointers to Chapel resources. Again, don't feel like you have to scribble these down. I'll make these slides available. Got our homepage, social media feeds on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and then a bunch of places where we interact with the community, to answer questions, talk to users, things like that. Um, on this slide, I've got a bunch of uh, suggested things to read or talks to watch if you want to learn more about Chapel or Arcuda or Champs. On this slide, I just want to mention briefly that we're hiring. Um, we're currently a team that's uh, 18 and a half full-time people working on Chapel. Uh, that's our full-time job all the time. We're planning on adding one or two more people in the next few months. And so if you're interested in that, check out this link. And if you're still um, in the middle of your studies, I'll mention that we also host summer interns and take Google Summer of Code students as other ways to work with the team.
let me just summarize. Um, Chapel is being used today for productive parallel programming at scale. I've shown you a couple of examples today uh, where users have reaped its productivity benefits in applications ranging from 16,000 to 48,000 lines. Um, I've showed you these aggregators we've been working on recently. And for gather, scatter, or sort patterns like we've seen in our CUDA, this is a really key uh, pattern for us to optimize and support. And then uh, again, Chapel GPU support is still in its very early days, arguably. Um, but it's improving by leaps and bounds. And I hope you saw that from the uh, step we took from last release to this release in terms of how clean the code looked. Um, and so ultimately, the goal here is to have users like the Champs team be able to leverage GPUs more productively in their code. And with that, I think I've got about four minutes for questions, um, if there are any. Great. Thanks for the talk, Brad. Um, we've got one question already in the chat, um, which I'll read. It's from Phil Miller. He asked, did automatic introduction of aggregation apply to other existing applications with noticeable performance impact? So you mentioned that recent paper. Uh, right, right, that's a really good question. So um, this is an optimization that to be honest, we have not turned on by default yet. Um, and the reason for that is that the memory overheads of the aggregators are pretty high. And we're not certain yet that this is something that should just sort of happen without the user opting into it. Um, so uh, we haven't tried it across a lot of applications, but what I will say is, with our CUDA, again, I mentioned that this pattern is beneficial in a lot of cases. There are currently something like 60-ish loops that uh, manually apply aggregators using the library that I showed earlier. And I think that the aggregation library currently catches between 40 and 50 of those automatically. Um, so that's good, but obviously there's still cases that uh, we can't automatically optimize where the ability for a user to do it is, is beneficial. And then in terms of performance, typically the the change between using the manual aggregators and the automatic ones we haven't looked at, uh, they're basically neck and neck because they're doing the same thing under the covers. Um, and so the other cases would be cases where users had not been using the aggregators and suddenly they use the flag and get a benefit. And again, because the flag is off by default, I don't happen to know of such cases off the top of my head. And it's still early days for that uh, optimization. So we need to talk to users more and, and get them trying it out to see what they see from that. But yeah, thanks for that question. I had a, another kind of similar question, which is how have the production applications fed back into the design of Chapel? So with Arcuda, you have this uh, aggregators uh, yeah. concept, but are there other examples of applications feeding back into the design of Chapel? So there definitely are, and I'm trying to think if I can come up with a really great example off the top of my head. Um, I'll say that, you know, for those who look at a Chapel timeline, there's sometimes very surprised at how long we've been around. So we've been working on this project for, uh, yeah, it's getting close to two decades since like the, the, in, the inception point of the project. Although it took us a long time to figure out what we were building and how we were gonna build it. Um, and the reason for that is because it's a very large and aggressive language as hopefully you've seen today. And for most of its history, if people asked us, should we be writing applications in Chapel? We would say, well, probably not yet, but what we'd like you to do is try out some of your key idioms, and give us feedback. So all throughout the course of the project, We've gotten tons of feedback and you know, most of the great stuff in language didn't come from those of us who started the language. It's things that we, you know, were suggested by users or sort of came up by looking at their codes or things like that. And uh, as I was killing for time, I'm trying to think. So we talk to the Arcuda, op the Arcuda users and the Champs users all the time and other users, and we're always getting feedback from them. And, and so I guess I'm just gonna say, yes, we definitely improved the language a lot uh, through user feedback. And I'm not coming up with a super great example, although, as you said, aggregators did come out of the Arcuda work originally, um, and that's that's a good example of one, I guess. Okay, thanks. Um, if anyone else has a question, we've got time for another. If you can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. I see Sandra's got a question. Oh, go ahead. I couldn't tell go, who that was. Go ahead, Sandra. Sandra, you're on mute. Yep, sorry, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so uh, one quick question about the aggregators. Did you consider pipelining? But I have a bigger philosophical question to, by pipeline, I mean aggregating bundles. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but the bigger philosophical question, and I wish we had the, these talks tomorrow when uh, after, after, uh, the, uh, after Alex Eichen's talk, but uh, listening to Legate, NumPy, and uh, generally this Python interpreter uh, type ideas, uh, 
I wonder what is your impression of this idea with the compiled language versus something that uh, uses the interpreter to do some symbolic execution, to do some compiler-like stuff uh, so that you stay within Python-like world uh, and you get the benefits of some compilation. So I don't know they are in truly interpreter languages, but they're kind of in between there. Uh, yeah. What what's what's your feeling for you know it's like it's of course a heavy compiler infrastructure that you're building there, if you just can rely on some Python then why not? So right. how do you respond to that? Yeah, so you know something we talked about from the earliest days of Chapel was wanting to have both a compiled and an interpreted mode because that ability to you know there wasn't uh, Jupyter back then but you know MATLAB was sort of what everyone wanted on their HPC system and that ability to do things interactively, and unfortunately early on in the project. We had to drop, we, we sort of started into that effort and we had to drop it because we we're just too small of a team to do both a compiler and an interpreter. Um, but as you say, like, you know, let's say Chapel continues to gain in popularity. Wouldn't it be great if I could just interactively program in Chapel rather than having to go through Python if I wasn't necessarily a Python programmer or I didn't want to deal with dynamic typing or things like that. And so that's something we actually have a new initiative we just started in the last six months, didn't make it into today's talk to basically go back and revamp our compiler significantly. And one of the things we're doing there is um, supporting more of like incremental compilation and compilation of little snippets of code uh, so that it could be integrated into like an interpreter or a debugger or things like that in order to evaluate chapel code and incorporate it into a running program dynamically. Um, so that's another effort that's still very much in its early days. We sort of envision this as being a three-year effort, but the goal of that will to be come out with a compiler that can be, do both sort of traditional static compilation like we do today, um, but also more of a, an interactive interpreted mode, if you will. Um, and you know, we hear from users a lot that that's something they would really value. And in fact, you know, they'd like to see Chapel and Jupyter and you can use Chapel and Jupyter today if you do it just right, but like C, it's kind of clunky because it's not an interpreted language. <laughs> so that's where we're going with that. You asked about okay. pipelining. I'd be happy to talk to that, but I realize we're a couple minutes over, so I'm also happy to That's turn right. over the next speaker if we'd like to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, Brad. Okay. Um, and we can take that question up at the break if if there's still interest. <laughs>